You're going to need your Bibles, so why don't you grab them and turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. We're going to finish off this chapter, and we're going to spill over into chapter 2. Uh, and as you're turning, I just want to start by asking you a question, okay? And I actually want you to respond by raising your hand. I know it's horribly uncomfortable. We're going to do it anyway. Um, here's my question. And I want all of our other campuses to do this as, uh, as you are together as well. How many of us in this room would say that the gospel has had a significant impact in our lives? Raise your hand if that's true of you. Okay, first of all, that's amazing. You can put your hands up. That's praise God for the work that he has done among us. That's awesome. If you're here and you don't know what I mean by the word gospel, what did he just say? Uh, can I just say, first of all, I'm glad you're here. You're more than welcome. Um, <clears throat> if you saw somebody next to you who raised their hand, you're already, you've already been so bold to show up to church. That's amazing. Um, can I encourage you after the service, ask somebody next to you, whether it was someone in front or next to you who raised their hand, ask that person, what, what is that gospel that you said that you believed and made such a difference in your life? Just, just take the opportunity. You're here. You might as well. Um, but let me ask you who raised your hands. Just another question. You don't have to answer this one out loud, just in your mind. What in particular has the gospel done in your life? What, what if I can say it, what practical impact has the gospel had in your life? Now, I've, as I was thinking about this question over the, the last week here, I was thinking, I actually wonder if the people who preach a gospel that's not the gospel of the Bible generally tend to be a little more clear about what the actual practical impact of their message is. So you take the prosperity gospel, which is a, uh, hey, are you sick? Hey, are you you're poor? Come, follow Jesus. He'll give you money. He'll give you health. That sounds like a pretty good deal. I'll take it. What's the practical impact? Well, it's pretty obvious. You're going to get money and you're going to get health. That sounds great. Okay, but what about the actual gospel? For some reason, I think we, we tend to not be very clear about what the gospel, what difference the gospel makes in our lives. What, if I can put it this way, what the gospel brings with it into our lives. What difference does it make that the gospel has come to your life than if it had never done that? That question is the question that I want you and I to bring to the text we're going to read and to bring to the life and ministry of Paul because Paul is now going to step back from his introduction. He's had this great praise of Jesus Christ, the sovereign ruler, sustainer of all things. He's now going to step back and just talk about his ministry for a moment. And what I want you and I to see is the gospel that he's been talking about up to this point and the gospel he'll continue to talk about in the book of Colossians has done some significant work in his life. It has brought some practical changes to his life and ministry. And what I think you'll see is that these practical changes actually come to your life too. Whether or not we've been able to articulate it well, these are actually things that the gospel brings with it to your life. Okay, so I got three things that we're gonna see from this text. I'll give them to you now so you know where we're going. First of all, the gospel brought to the life of Paul meaningful suffering. So we're going to start on a high note. Be great. Secondly, it brought a message with magnitude. And finally, it brought a means to maturity. Okay? Meaningful suffering, a message with magnitude, and a means to maturity. So let's get started. The first one, Colossians chapter 1, just verse 24, meaningful suffering. What does he say? Now... I rejoice in my sufferings. Okay, first of all, um, every now and then we just kind of need to back up and realize just how wild some of the things that Paul says are. Um, Paul's in prison as he writes this letter. If I were in prison, the tone of my letter would be, hey, get me out of here. I don't like it. I rejoice in my sufferings. That's not something that I think we even want to be able to say, is it? I just want out of my sufferings. Why would I want to rejoice in my suffering? And that, that's the posture Paul's taking. He's in prison. He's dealt with so many things. Shipwrecked, sick, imprisoned, and he's rejoicing. Why? Why would somebody rejoice in their sufferings? I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body that is the church. Okay, now this is one of the most debated verses in the New Testament as to what Paul is exactly saying. But I actually think there's a way to understand this quite simply. And I'm not trying to be overly bold in saying that. Um, obviously, he's not saying, when he says that there's something lacking in Christ's afflictions, he can't be saying that on the cross, Jesus suffered a fair amount, but it wasn't quite enough. It wasn't like we just sang here at Downs Road, all sufficient merit. 
It wasn't quite that much. Um, there's, no, there's no way that's what Paul's meaning. First of all, he never uses this term, Christ's afflictions, to refer to the cross. He actually, just in the previous passage, talked about the blood of the cross. That's the kind of language Paul uses to talk about Jesus' redemptive substitutionary death. So he can't be talking about that. But also the whole point of the book of Colossians is that Jesus is the the all-sufficient savior. We don't need anything more than him. So we can't be meaning that Jesus didn't quite do enough and Paul's saying, I'm just kind of, I'm just topping it up. We need a little more suffering. He can't be saying that. So what is he saying when he says that I am filling up in my flesh what's lacking in Christ's afflictions? I think the key is in this little phrase, for the sake of his body. Now that's an image that Paul has used already in this letter. Let's go back for a moment to verse 18. Paul is writing about Jesus. He, Jesus, is the head of the body, which is the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. So there's that, there's that picture. So Paul is suffering for the sake of the body of Jesus, And Jesus is the head of the body. How does this make sense? Okay, well, here's what what Paul is saying. Forgive my artwork. Um, There's your body, right? We can kind of catch what's going on here. Uh, This is Jesus. And this is you and me. So Paul is saying that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, something so significant happens. We are so united to Jesus that we could be called his body, connected to the head. And what he means by that is that everything that happens to the head happens to the body. That when Jesus, the head, goes to the cross, what happens to the body? It goes to the cross. When that head dies on the cross, what happens to the body? The body dies. When that head was buried in a tomb, what happened to the body? It was buried in that tomb. When the head raised from the grave, what happened to the body? We came out of that grave too. That everything that happened to Jesus, who is our head, like you can't walk into a room with just your head and not your body and still be alive. That just doesn't work, right? Don't try it. He's the head and we're the body. Everything that happened to the head happens to the body. So here's what Paul is saying. If the head suffers... What happens to the body? It suffers. Okay, this might be a difficult image for you to try and understand. How, just how does this work? I'm not like physically attached to Jesus in some way. How do I become united to him in this way that he would be called the head and I'm called the body? Well, uh, let me give you an illustration that I think is particularly helpful. And you at Central, I'm sorry, I've I've used this before, but I think it's it's one of the best illustrations that I could give as to how we become united to Christ in this way. Uh, The great reformer, Martin Luther, you may have heard his name. Uh, When he had his great conversion, he started to look for language to try and figure out, how do I explain the gospel? How do I start to convey and communicate this to people? And so he decided to go to the book that you and I would all turn to, the Song of Solomon. Right, Song of Songs. Uh, You know, my beloved, all that kind of great stuff. And the verse he picked out was in chapter one, where it says, my beloved is mine and I am his. He said, that's the gospel. Because the picture is this, that he goes on to describe, is of a great king who owns all things, who is the ruler of all things, and a prostitute who is weak and sinful. And the king comes to that prostitute and says, I will take you as my own. There's no other way that the prostitute could become the wife of that king. She couldn't clean herself up. She couldn't go to enough church services. There's nothing she could do except that the king would come to her and say, I take you as mine. And she, by faith, says, Yes, please. And in their wedding ceremony, these are the vows that they begin to exchange. That she looks to him and says, all that I have, I share with you. And all that I am, I give to you. And he in return says, all that I am, I give to you. And all that I have, I share with you. And now they're united. (laughs) So the, the woman has said, all of my shame and guilt and sin, I share with you everything that's mine. And he takes it and he deals with it. And in return, he says, all that I am. 
my life, my death, my righteousness, my kingdom, my father, I share with you all that is mine. And she says, amen. (laughs) There's the gospel. So how is it that you can be united to Christ as the head and all that's his is counted as yours? It's because like this image of a marriage, by faith we have entered into a covenant relationship with him that all that is his he shares with us and all that is ours we share with him. He takes it, he deals with it, and he gives us his righteousness in all of it. I mean, it's glorious gospel. (laughs) It's amazing. But it's not just the good stuff. (laughs) If the head suffers, if the groom who says, I will take all that is yours, suffers, what happens to us? Should we not expect that we also would suffer? Well, absolutely. (laughs) We should, it shouldn't be surprising. And this is all over the New Testament, quite frankly. <clears throat> this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses three to five. Paul again says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. United to our head, the body suffers, but united to our head, the body shares abundantly in comfort too. 1 Peter chapter four. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. This isn't isn't strange. This shouldn't be surprising but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body that is the church. So Christ is the head, Paul is a part of this body and Paul is suffering, so who is suffering too? Christ. When you and I suffer, Christ suffers with us because we are his body and he is our head. Will we ever be separated from our head? Listen, what great confidence, actually courage this should give us to know that that's the gospel because where is the head right now? Where is our head, Christ Jesus, seated at the right hand of our father? So what does that mean about our future? Where are we gonna be? seated at the right hand of our father. This idea is not, it's not complicated. It's not crazy um, to know that we have to suffer, that it's a, part of, uh, it's a part of salvation to suffer, to then enjoy the good that we receive from it. Um, you, hear the, you hear the saying all the time, right? No pain, no gain. Um, that in real sense is what's happening here. When our little guy, uh, Ozias, was born three months ago, um, He's been a delight and a joy in our lives. We've absolutely loved having him around. I mean, he's a little exhausting, but worth it. Um, In order to have the joy and delight of our little guy around us, we had to suffer through a particularly difficult day on March 31st, right? I had to suffer through four and a half hours of repeatedly saying, inhale, two, three, four, exhale, two, four hours. Like I almost fainted. And then, and then we're right near the end. Like things are getting wrapping up to the conclusion. And Shalane has me in a sleeper chokehold, ready to knock me out because I guess it hurts. And <laughs> she wasn't, wasn't asking me how I was doing. And then I had to sleep on the most uncomfortable chair that ever exists. They decide to try and get you out as soon as possible by making it awful. We had to suffer for one day Okay, Shalan had to suffer for like nine months more than that, so she gets more credit. Um, In order to receive the joy and delight of having our little boy, there was difficult things to face. There's all sorts of stories that we could tell, right? Of receiving the crown, of crossing that marathon finish line. It's gonna hurt, but that's what it takes. It comes with it what comes with the joy of our salvation, the righteousness, the kingdom, the relationship with our father, everything that Christ shares with us comes with his sufferings. So let me say this. I don't know what you're enduring. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what kind of sufferings you have had to endure. 
Um, I honestly probably can't imagine how bad many of you have had it. But I can say this, that when the Son of God, who is the light of the world, stepped down into darkness, that darkness pressed in on him. He suffered, he was tempted, he endured, and he eventually died. But did the darkness overcome him? No. You are the light of the world, says Jesus. The darkness is gonna press in and press hard, but will the darkness overcome you? Never, never, because Christ suffers with you. Your sufferings matter, they're meaningful. And Paul in particular knew that his sufferings were for the sake of the church. He was preaching the gospel and what it took for people to hear the message of Jesus was his imprisonment. What, what the gospel brought to his life was meaningful suffering. Secondly, the gospel brings a message with magnitude. So this Paul carries on. The, the church, right? The body, the church of which I became a minister or a servant, right? Um, sometimes we see pastors as people who are the high, like they're, they're the ones on stage. They're awesome, high and mighty. The, the way the scriptures speak of pastors is as your servants. And I sure hope that we can foster that posture in our hearts. A servant, according to the stewardship that was given, that God has given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Now, when he says the word of God, you got to remember, um, he's literally writing Colossians as we speak. He's writing the word of God as we think of it. So he actually, there, there are certain letters that aren't even written yet. When he says the word of God, he, he can't be meaning the full canon of scripture it's possible that he's thinking of that in a future sense. He knows that it will be written. But as we carry on this sense, we're gonna see that he's meaning something in particular, not just the whole Bible, but something in it in particular, the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. What's this mystery? And when you and I hear the word mystery, you and I, are, we're thinking of Sherlock Holmes, right? Oh, we gotta figure it out. And this is some sort of fancy fancy insider information that we just hope we can get. That's, that's not how he uses the term mystery. When the New Testament uses the word mystery, it's talking about something in God's purposes that would never have been known if God had not revealed it. Something of God's purpose that would never be known unless God himself revealed it. And what is this mystery? Well, he carries on. To them who are the Gentiles, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So what is this mystery? What's this message that he has now received in his life that he's now backing up to say, listen, this message is full of riches and glory. This isn't something that he says, you know, this is something I talk about every now and then, like my love for Manchester United. It's, it's you know, it's great. no. It's full of riches and glory. This is the best thing that Paul has. The mystery, which is Christ in you. But he says this really interesting statement as he's making this comment. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles. Why does he throw that in there? He, he, he didn't have to include the Gentiles, just how great among the world. But he throws in the word Gentiles. What, is this, what does this have to do with what he's saying? Well, it's, it's because for the entire course of history, since God began to interact with the people of Israel through Abraham, the Israelites thought that all of God's promises of salvation were for them and them alone. They were God's people. They were his special chosen people. They were the law keepers. They were the ones who had the law and they said, let's do it. I mean, they didn't do a great job, but they tried. In Ephesians, which uh, most people think is being written pretty much at the exact same time as Colossians, Paul writes this. He says, therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You who had no right in the eyes of the world to claim the promises of God have now been brought near. That 
The Jewish nation thought that they were the keepers of the law. They were the ones who deserved the salvation given to them by God. Began to develop what, you know, would kind of be natural in a very sinful heart. Uh, just this salvation snobbery of, yeah, you know what? We are the right people to get this because we are the good people. Like look around at how these other people live, how these, all these Gentiles live. This is, that's not the way. No, gee, God would not save them. Now we might be far removed from this Jewish Gentile division, but I think it's fair to say that this salvation snobbery is also quite present. Is it not true that sometimes we can feel in our hearts, we look at somebody and say, well, they just don't act the way that a Christian should act. They don't talk the way a Christian should talk. They don't support the right causes that Christians support. They don't, they don't disagree with the wrong causes. They don't, they don't speak the right words. They don't show up at the right service, right? They're not as good a Christian as I am. I mean, I've figured this out. God saved me. And what Paul is saying, listen, back up. Do you not realize the magnitude of this message is that it is not just for you who think you've cleaned yourself up, but for the Gentiles who were far from God, who had no right to claim any of it, they too have received Christ in them. That no matter what somebody looks like, speaks like, thinks like, no matter what you look like, speak like, think like, no matter the mistakes you've made, the regrets you carry, the struggles that you're currently facing, if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, then Christ is in you. The hope of glory. Where the head goes, so goes the body. He is your hope of glory. Don't look inside and say, huh, have I figured myself out? Am I living a good enough life that deserves to be saved? You're never gonna see it. It's not there. Look to Christ. He is the hope of glory. This is, a, this is not a puny gospel. And I think sometimes the way that we speak to people about this Jesus that we know, I think we speak of it, this message, like it's so small. It's just a part of our lives. It's, it's a bonus, really. Everything else hasn't really changed, but I trust Jesus and I believe in him for the forgiveness of my sins. The gospel Paul's talking about is no puny gospel. It's full of the riches and glory of God that any who trust in Jesus Christ receive Christ in them, the hope of glory. Yeah. Um, that's a message of magnitude. And then finally, a means to maturity. So he carries on. Having this message and proclaiming it to people, what now does he endeavor to do? Well, we'll pick it up. Him, meaning Jesus, who is the riches of glory, right? Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Notice just for a moment, um, Paul's not, not uh, making any mistakes here. Listen, everyone, everyone. I want everyone to be mature in Christ. Sometimes I think that there's this sense in the church of there are the people who are, who are the learners and growers. They're maturing, they go to the Bible studies, but I just gotta, I just show up to service and that's, you know, I think that's all my Christian life is gonna be. Listen, the Bible knows nothing of somebody who puts their faith in Jesus, but who does not continue to grow to maturity. There's, there's, that's not, not even a part of the story. There's no description of someone who would trust Jesus and stay exactly as they are. His goal in his ministry is to present everyone mature in Christ because that's the goal. For this, I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Now, as we go to the next slide, I want you to think, okay, so he wants everybody to be mature in Christ. Let's see what he means by that because he's gonna apply it to a particular group. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea, this other city and another church, and for all who have not seen me face to face. I, I long for all of you that this would happen, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love. Remember, he just said, I want you to be mature. This, this must be a part of what that maturity is. Full of courage, unity in love. To reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ 
in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So, so at least maturity must in some sense look a little bit like that. Courage, assurance, knowledge of God's mystery. But here's the thing. Um, how do we get there? How do we come to maturity? Well, I had somebody, uh, a mentor of mine, sit me down at, I was 21 years old. He was a leadership coach and he became a, a real mentor to me, still is to this day. And he said to me, okay, Joshua, you're 21. Where do you want to be when you're 60? And I said, oh boy, uh, alive would be great. That's about all I can think of. And he said, well, you, you have to be able to answer that question or else you're going to end up who knows where. You, you, it, it might be great. The Lord is going to guide your story. But if you don't have a sense of where you're going, you're probably never going to get there. And so he sat me down and he gave me this real simple concept. You, you probably all know of a concept like this. A plus B equals C, right? C is where you want to go. This is my goal. In, at, at 60, this is who I want to be. A is where I am. And B is how I get there. Now we, we do this with all sorts of things, right? We do this with our finances. You sit down and you say, I want to save $10,000. I have $0. So I have to save a lot of bottles, right? I have to stop driving my fancy car, whatever it is. I would sell the car, whatever, you know, you got to get $10,000. We do this with our relationships. I want that girl to dig me. I'm a dweeb. <laughs> what do I do, right? Start untucking your shirt. <laughs> I actually didn't untuck my shirt before Shalane and I got married. And then I started because I had to. We do this as all, all manner of things. But I don't know if I've met a Christian who I've sat down with and said, do you have a goal for your spiritual growth? Do you know where you're going? Do you know where you are? And do you know how to get there? We make all sorts of financial plans. We make all sorts of relational plans, all sorts of life plans. I don't know many Christians who make spiritual plans, plans to grow to maturity. So what do we have to do? Well, we have to know what this is. Where are we going? Or else we're never going to get there. So the great passage of what God is bringing us to, Romans 8, 29, he says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. There it is. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So what is he doing? He is bringing you to the likeness of his son, Jesus Christ. That is maturity. But that is way too broad to look like Jesus. In what way? How? Are we talking about his prayer? Yes. Are we talking about the way that he treated people? Yes. Are we talking about the way that he received all things from the Lord, even his sufferings? Yes. The only way to know what that maturity in Jesus, the likeness of Jesus looks like is to start to get to know what the life of Jesus was like. That's what your maturity will be. And you got to know where you, where you are. You got to back up and say, you know, I'm not, I'm not a particularly gracious person. I'm not a particularly good prayer -er, you know, whatever it might be. And then how do I get there? Well, what did, what did Paul say? Here's the key. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom. Why? that we may present everyone mature in Christ. What is the means to your maturity? It's not pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, figuring it out. It's not necessarily church attendance. It's not Bible study attendance. It's not praying. It is hearing, seeing, meeting with Jesus Christ. He is the means to your maturity. Go looking nowhere else. This is the point of the book of Colossians. They're getting caught up in all these other things. If maybe I do that, if maybe I do this. And Paul's saying, no, you have everything in Jesus. If you come to him, if you pray, let it be a prayer of coming to the Lord Jesus. If you come to the word, let it be that you hear the very words of Jesus. When you gather with the people of God, remember that you stand among the body of Jesus. The only way that you will come to maturity is through Jesus Christ. There's no other way. You can come up with all sorts of fancy books and read them and that'd be great. I'm sure there's lots to learn there. 
The only way you'll grow is through Jesus. He is the means. So listen, you can't, can't expect ever to get here. Even no matter how much you want to get there, you might say, I love that. I'd love to be more like Jesus. I'd love to be mature in the faith. You will never get there if you don't begin to realize that there are some practical steps we need to take. There are things we need to do. Namely, we need to come to Jesus. Readily, often, persistently come to Jesus who is the means of our maturity. Know where you're going, know where you are, and know how to get there. And that's what Paul is doing. He's saying, listen, I want you to come to maturity, so I'm gonna do one thing. I'm gonna proclaim Jesus, I'm gonna warn you, and I'm gonna teach you about Jesus. So whatever you can do to put yourself in the way of the gospel, to hear of Jesus, his great work on the cross, to see Jesus at work, whatever you can do, do it so that you might grow to maturity, to begin to enjoy the likeness of the son of God. So let me, let me end with the same question that I started with. And I know you're gonna have to raise your hand to question again. Uh, how many of us in this room and at our campuses would say that the gospels made a significant impact in our lives? Great. I hope, I hope that what you can look to, what you can do is look at your life and see that these things are there that the gospel has brought with it meaningful suffering. Christ has been with you. He's suffered too. That it has brought a message that is no small message. This is a great, glorious gospel. That it has brought with it a means to maturity. You have Christ in you. You can grow. So enjoy those things. And there are far more that the scriptures are gonna teach us. But again, let me encourage you, if you're new here, and you don't know what this has all been about. Some of you just saw someone raise their hand again. Talk to them. What's this gospel? What has it done in your life? I'd love to hear. Let me pray. God, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the many, many things that we can learn from it about you, for your great character, your great love. We thank you, particularly, Father, in our sufferings, to know that Jesus is with us because he has gone ahead and suffered on our behalf And now we, in this world of sin and darkness, we suffer too, but he's with us. And Father, uh, for the many other ways that you have worked in our lives, that the gospel has brought great impact to us, we bless you and we praise you. And we ask God, would you open our eyes to see the many good things that you've done? So uh, as we now continue to, to be together as the body of your son, Jesus Christ, would we magnify you and worship you? with full hearts. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.